Well, here we are, and um, I'm going to time myself as well. And um, this discussion is about the first person who tried to plan an economy in East Asia during the First World War. And um, I'm not going to say that Nishihara Kamezo is himself the origin of developmentalist policy in East Asia, but a lot of things that, was, that were associated with him were the antecedents of developmentalist policy in this um, continent. And what I'm trying to achieve is to say that there is no such thing as East Asian exceptionalism, because developmental authoritarianism was very much a European thing. And um, most people would think that socialist policy in East Asia started in the late 1940s. I'm going to push it back to about 1907. I'm going to push back also the co prosperity ideal for 20 years to about 1917, and to argue that it was originally not a militaristic aggression um, uh, vision, and, um, and that it was also socialistic. So the, um, after the Second World War, um, in East Asia, there was um, um, a wave of developmentalist authoritarian governments. And um, most of these involved you know, um, a highly rationalized and monopolized economy, GMP growthism, and large-scale infrastructural construction. Now, I would argue that the origins of such a system would be German state socialism as practiced under Bismarck after 1879, and as modernized by Walter Rathenau as a planned economy during the First World War. And it was emulated by Lenin as war communism in 1917, and then brought back by the socialist countries in East Asia by the late 1940s. And Nishihara Kamezo introduced to Asia Rathenau system and there was also a state socialist movement within China itself, and they collaborated in, during the First World War to um, form something called the East Asian Economic League, which uh, barely got off. But um, uh, during the 1920s, Stalin's planned economy was introduced to East Asia, and it merged into the state socialist movement. And by the 1930s, it was all economic statism all across East Asia, uh, going all the way to the 1980s. Now, research on the Nishara loans, which was actually a Marshall Plan um, for China, dating from 1917, is absent on a lot of works on Japanese diplomacy, Pan-Asianism, and socialism. And most people, when they talk about the Nishara loans, talk about it as a sort of extension to the 21 demand. It was actually very different. Uh, there was also the assumption that Nishihara was undereducated, and I'll talk about that in a second, and it ignored Nishihara's domestic reform proposals whilst concentrating on his proposals for China, thereby uh, relegating him to the role of an imperialist. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about Nishihara's place in the evolution of industrial thought since the 19th century. So developmentalism really came from mercantilism, and it was started by Louis XIV and Jean-Baptiste uh, Colbert in the um, 16th, 17th centuries. And um, Alexander Hamilton modernized it for the newly born United States as a sort of industrialization policy for um, the economic independence of this new country. And then it was picked up by Henri de Saint-Simon, a uh, French uh, aristocrat who fought during the American War of Independence. And um, Henri de Saint-Simon thought of building a society run by productive classes, not aristocrats. And um, huge industrial uh, and infrastructure projects such as the Suez and Panama Canals would link up the world. And after his death, his movement split into left and right. The left, left by um, Constantin Picker, uh, proposed a planned economy whereby there would be production targets for each province based on how much resources and how much productivity they had. And on the Sansimonian rights, they were the Pere brothers who really started the modern sense of invest investment banking. And then in the 1820s, Friedrich List was brought to America by um, the Marquis de Lafayette. And he saw what Henri de Saint-Simon and um, like Alexander Hamilton was doing and Henry Clay was doing. So he advocated state economic intervention, industrialization. And he was also seen as one of the, fa the antecedents of the modern European Union because he advocated the German customs union and sort of a co-prosperity sphere in Central Europe. Now, in 1879, after a 10-year economic depression in Germany, Bismarck turned to state socialism. And um, he had List works all the time on his desk as a reference. And in 1889, List was translated into Japanese by um, a group of um, bureaucrats who were fed up with the laissez-faire policies being enacted under Matsukada Masayoshi. And um, they formed the National Association for Economics, um, which uh, was formed in 1890 to promote Lysianism, state interventionism, industrialization, and so on and so forth. And 1892, a man called Komachi Tomotsune, who was 
the finance ministry translation officer, and later to become Nishawa's mentor, assumed leadership of this association. And um, this book became so influential that in 1901 onwards, it was translated into Chinese. And in 1906, Japan nationalized its railways um, following uh, the state socialist policies of Bismarck. And in the 1900s, throughout the 1900s, Japan was referred to by both the domestic and foreign press as being the most accessible state socialist state outside Europe. Now, Walter Ratzenau um, was head of the raw material section of the German war ministry during the First World War, um, and he was running probably the first set of big data in the world. He was using punch card computers to analyze economic data, and he was running the first planned economy in the world's history. And um, Lenin picked up on that uh, idea and implemented it as state, um, as war communism. But he actually called Rattenau's system as state monopoly capitalism, refusing to acknowledge it as any sort of socialism. Now, we'll come back to this term, state monopoly capitalism, later on, because it was used to um, describe Japan's economy during the 1960s and 70s. After the 1911 revolution in China, um, Japan's leading elites split into two factions. Yamagata Aritomo advocated for military intervention in China, whereas Katsuo Taro and Goto Shinpei um, advocated for economic cooperation with the new Chinese regime. And um, they um, advocated the establishment of an Oriental Bank, um, which was then sabotaged by the proposal of the 21 demands, which had nothing to do with these two particular people. So it shows you how diverse the Japanese elite was between the imperialists, the um, moderate imperialists, and, the, and those who advocated a, a, a cooperative and collaborative um, relationship with China, in, um, including Shibasawa Eiji, who went to China and said, I'm so sorry that my country has been so arrogant towards you Chinese, I'm going to start a new policy with you. But that was sabotaged again by the 21 demands and the start of the First World War. And Teoji Mastake spoke of the 21 demands as destroying peace in the Orient. And because he had spent 10 years in France, he knew it was going to land China and Japan in exactly the same relationship as Germany and France. So when he went into power in 1916, with Nishihara Kamezo as his aide, he explored a new China policy that was to be centered upon economic cooperation. Now Nishihara Kamezo was looked down upon by all of Japan's elites because it was, come from, it was coming from a humble peasant origin. Um, he was born north of Kyoto, and uh, in Korea in the 1900s, he tried to propose a developmentalist policy, which was in, at odds with the um, Japanese policy in Korea at the time, which was exploitative. And then um, as Teoji's aide in the 1910s, it, he was um, commissioned to draft uh, a manifesto based on state socialism called Strategy for Economic State Building, which was held by a group of young bureaucrats and something called the Association for the Study of Social Policy, which was the most um, for, for, uh, foremost um, organization advocating social reform in Japan at the time. Now, uh, uh, Nishihara tried to um, transplant Ratanao into East Asia, and he compared Japan's low productivity at 60 yen per capita to all of those figures in Europe and, um, and the US. And he advocated thorough industrial policy in order to reach a GNP of 200 or more per capita. So he said, in short, the requirements of the new era is a controlled economic state socialism that promotes the improvement of popular living standards. And he advocated land reform, which was actually stricter than the 1946 land reform um, requirements. It would give two hectares only to each family. And he also uh, wanted to abolish the retail industry by uh, building town centre department stores that would be run by the government. Um, and he also advocated hydroelectricity and um, industrial zones and so on and so forth. So he was on the same page as Lenin, who proposed the electrification of the Soviet Union. And for China and Central Asia, he thought that Japan's policy should be uh, consistent with the needs of China. Now, this is unique. He's putting China's needs at the center of his policy considerations, not Japan's needs. And he's saying that China's needs are consistent with Japan's future needs and future prosperity. So the sort of reciprocative um, thinking here is unique at the time and unparalleled even all the way to the 1950s and 60s before Ikeda Hayato basically. So he advocated um, developing wool in northwestern China, um, developing mines all across China and building this 
Central Asian Transversal Railway, which would link um, Qingdao to um, Baghdad and onwards to um, Europe. And it would turn Qingdao into a port that would rival Shanghai, not even uh, eclipse Shanghai. Now, China had its own state socialist movement. Um, in the 1900s, uh, people like Liang Qichao um, thought that um, the, the future of industrial organization lie in, not in laissez-faire, but in the building of trust in combines. And interestingly enough, um, his idea of trust in combines being supervised and led by the government was exactly what happened in South Korea and Japan after the Second World War. And in 1908, Yang Tu even spoke to the Manchu nobles about economic militarism. And in 1911, uh, Sheng Shenhui, who was uh, under the influence of Katsu Taro, whom you might remember from my previous slide, um, he initiated the, the railway nationalization policy for China, which unfortunately failed and led to the 1911 revolution. And after the revolution, Sun Yat-sen, um, who was the leader of the revolution, declined to reverse railway nationalization, saying that railway nationalization was actually the basis of state socialism. And Sun Chao who was president of the Kuomintang, said that the Kuomintang should advocate and adopt uh, state socialism in order to foster the livelihood of our citizens and use state authority to promote even and rapid economic development, which was actually developmentalist. Now, even the pay young bureaucrats, who were actually the late imperial bureaucrats, were converted to state socialism, including people like Chou Xiuxi, who was finance minister, and Zhang Qian, who was um, advocating something called the Cotton and Iron Doctrine. And from this university, Chen Jintao, who was a graduate of Harvard, um, proposed various bills on taxes, including a Chinese National Insurance Board in 1916. So there was a real movement towards state socialist policies um, on the Bismarckian model in the early 1910s. And China's chance came during the First World War when um, to take care of, uh, to take consideration of the um, rising raw material prices in Europe and elsewhere, um, ge uh, geologists in China working in the Ministry of Agriculture and, Finance, uh, Agriculture and Commerce under Zhang Jian um, advocated um, a, a huge plan to increase the production of steel, copper, wool, cotton, and so on and so forth, involving the increase of steel production from 30,000 tonnes to 112,500 tonnes. And Nishihara actually stepped in to provide finance for this plan, and they wanted to build the National First Steelworks of the Republic of China, which was only um, sabotaged when the military wing of the Japanese government um, proposed, well, collaboration with Sun Yat-sen, who was having a rebellion against the Peking regime, and actually the military supported the rebel movement, whilst the rest of the civilian government supported the Peking regime. So actually, the Chinese Civil War became a sort of a proxy war between the civilian and the military branches of the Japanese government. And that was how the Nishihara's funding um, became squandered in the 10-year um, civil war that China had until 1927. But to look at the industrial proposals um, written by King Ben Kian and Woman Hao, you would see that they were written in 1917 and meant for completion in 1921. So this was basically China's first five-year plan long before any sort of communist uh, ideological intervention. Now, in the 1920s, uh, Nishihara continued to advocate a controlled economy, and one of the men in his circle, Yamamoto Jotaro, um, argued for exactly the same thing as Nishihara Kamezo, a strategy of economic state building, which then morphed into an advocacy for a five-year plan for Japan, um, which was taken up by Inu Kaichiyoshi in 1932 until he was assassinated in May that year for refusing to um, acknowledge Manchukuo. Uh, but had it um, succeeded, had it materialized, Japan would have gone into a fully state socialist um, course that would have changed the whole um, future for East Asia. Now, Kishinobu Suke, who was a reform, a reform bureaucrat, took part in the negotiations on the um, five-year plan. And he would later be um, head of um, the um, planning apparatus in Manchukuo from 1936 onwards, and he made two five-year plans for Manchukuo, thus launching Manchukuo onto the course of the Stalinistic, socialistic industrialization long before communist takeover. And in China, the <coughs> Kuomintang technocrats who were sent to the pod, exactly the same men who uh, collaborated with Nishihara, 
Ting Vinh Kang and Wong Wen Hao, um, continued to uh, draft all sorts of plans for Chinese industrialization through to the 1940s. And the men that they trained, including Wong Wen Hao himself, stayed on with the People's Republic until the 1960s, and in some cases until the 1980s. And one of them even helped draft the basic law of Hong Kong in the mid-1980s. So it shows you the continuity of policies uh, in China. Whilst in Japan, the Cabinet Planning Board, which was formed of a lot of left-wingers and socialists in the closet, um, they made reference to the Soviet plant economy, and they were actually in charge of the post-war Japanese economic miracle up until, again, the 1970s and 1980s. And in Korea, Nishihara Kamezo advised Governor Ugaki Katsushige, who was a reformist uh, military man, to um, communalize the Korean peasantry in the early 1930s. And actually, a few days ago, when I was at the Library of Congress, I saw Ugaki's plan to electrify all of Korea with a huge electrical grid. Um, and that was a plan dating from 1930 and 31. So his plans were high modernist, using James E. Scott's um, um, words. And I would say that after the Second World War, Kim Il-sung and Park Chung-hee represented the left and the right of Sansimonianism. And Park Chung-hee, when he overthrew Sing Man Ri, who was a young Ban aristocrat and installed a technocratic military regime in South Korea, that was a very Sansimonian thing because that was all Sansimonianism was about, overthrowing the aristocrats and installing the productive classes as the ruler of the country. The South Korea was actually a very Sansimonian regime after the 1960s. And in Japan, state monopoly capitalism, as you might remember, was used to describe the rationale system, was used by Oji Tsutomu to describe the mitty led um, state-directed capitalist system in post-war Japan. And actually, in 1963, uh, Mitty tried to reinstall the 1940s controls, but that was met with a fierce um, um, pushback by the commercial interests. But um, Sahaji Shigeru, who was um, at the forefront of the 1963 attempt, he was mentor to Konaka Keiichi, who wrote for Tanaka Kakue, the famed 1972 um, manifesto, The Remodeling of the Japanese Archipelago. So it shows you that the Sansimonian state-controlled, state-monopoly capitalist sentiment was very much alive in Japan until the 1970s. And Ikeda Hayato was close enough to Nishihara to have written the calligraphy on his grave. So it shows you that the national income doubling plan and Ikeda's reapproachment with continental China and North Korea for trade in the 1960s might have something to do with Nishihara's plans in the 1910s and his vision of a um, reciprocal East Asian developmental strategy. And it's, this is my last slide. So his indirect legacy is in the form of Tushima Juichi's relationship with Ohira Masayoshi. Now, Tushima helped Nishihara draft his proposals in 1917. And um, he, was, he, la he lasted long enough in Japanese politics to become president of the Tokyo Olympic Committee in 1964. And he was mentor to Ohira Masayoshi, who was, men uh, who was prime minister from 1978 to 1980, and he lent money, ODA loans, to um, Deng Xiaoping under the advice of Mayo Shikisaburo, who was actually heavily influenced by Nishihara during the 1950s. So Nishihara's foresight came, um, you know, it materialized in the late 70s and the early 1980s. His success therefore came 60 years late, but without all that attempt in the 1910s to promote a non-militaristic reciprocal economic cooperative vision for East Asia. Our relationship with Japan now would be vastly different. Thank you very much. All right, so four people in 75 minutes always means a battle against the clock. Uh, we might have time for one question if everyone has one.